while back, we took a look at a collection of games that took clear inspiration from God of War. But there were far too many games inspired by that particular franchise for me to cover in one go. God of War style games became the default state of games for a hot minute. And why wouldn't it? It was a relatively simple formula that was easily replicated and a proven success. The Spectacle Fighter, or character action game, whatever you prefer, existed long before God of War. But you suddenly started to see a lot of imitators pop up as a direct result of the sudden popularity of God of War. Which itself had a lot of different inspirations. Ninja Gaiden, Onimusha, Devil May Cry, Ico. But it eclipsed all those games in popularity, so it ended up being the thing that inspired an entire generation of games. It became the default game. Every era has the default game. In the 80s, it was Mario-style 2D platformers. In the 90s, it was 3D platformers with collectibles and exploration elements, as well as Doom-style first-person shooters. In the late 2000s and early 2010s, it was all about the Call of Duty-style first-person shooter, as well as the Uncharted-slash-Gears-of-War-style third-person shooters. And in more recent years, it's all about the sandbox. What I refer to as the default game is essentially the game or genre that's most commonly being replicated during a certain period in time. You can tell what the default game of any era is based on tie-in games. Whatever the current in thing is to rip off will usually end up with a lot of cheap tie-in games to various intellectual property in that style. Which isn't a bad thing. If you're working on a tie-in game, you're probably working with the understanding that you're not going to be lighting the world on fire, so you might as well just make something that's decent, playable, and is a style of game with a proven track record. And I found that in the mid to late 2000s, as well as the early 2010s, there were a lot of tie-in games that were made in the style of God of War. And you can tell that they were inspired simply because they attempted to be very similar to God of War mechanically. Matter of fact, there were so many tie-in games that you can even narrow them down further than just being tie-in games. Like, I found several superhero tie-in games that were made in the style of God of War. So that's what we're going to be covering today. Five, or rather four and a half games that were meant to tie into various superhero franchises and were inspired to varying degrees by God of War. As a matter of fact, all but one of these games are also tie-ins to superhero movies. So let's start off with possibly the earliest example of this highly specific but nonetheless still crowded subgenre, Ghost Rider. Comic book movies that existed before the MCU are an interesting subject. You tended to see more movies with more artistic expression because there was no set template just yet. But at the same time, they were a lot more hit and miss. For every Sam Raimi Spider-Man, you had three abortively bad superhero movies. Case in point, 2007's Ghost Rider starring Nicolas Cage. A movie that, depending on your perspective, is either so bad it's good or one of Nicolas Cage's worst movies. And that's a crowded field. However, I'm going off public opinion because I've only seen this movie once and it left no lasting impression. So I remember basically nothing about it. Let me know what you think about this movie in the comments section below. That said, regardless of the movie's quality, this is during a time when every superhero movie got a tie-in game, including Halle Berry's Catwoman. So here we go with Ghost Rider on PS2, making this, to my knowledge, the only game to star Nicolas Cage. Oh wait, no it doesn't, because as you'll see, it appears they didn't get the likeness rights for Nicolas Cage, so it's just some dude. That's kind of disappointing. Now, since I know jack all of sh** about Ghost Rider, both the movie and the comic, I don't know how well this ties into either. It appears it takes place after our boy Johnny has had the Ghost Rider powers for a while, and the plot concerns Mephisto, who appears to be Marvel's version of Satan, allegedly losing control over his army, so the demons of hell have started escaping to the surface and wreaking havoc, meaning the angels of heaven are putting pressure on Mephisto to get it under control. Also, Mephisto is such an unfortunate name. So he gets Ghost Rider to sort it all out, leading Ghost Rider to go to several different locations taking out demons large and small, as well as major named characters. He also rescues his girlfriend Roxanne at one point. Of course Mephisto is basically Satan, so he's entirely not on the level. So of course this leads to a big betrayal where he's actually using Ghost Rider to open a portal to hell on the surface. Whoops. It's a serviceable comic booky plot that frames the action, and I like that they integrate all the traveling you do into the plot by establishing that as the geoglyph that would end up being the portal that Mephisto was to open. And by using Ghost Rider, he could do it right under the noses of Heaven's armies. But otherwise, the story is pretty much a light touch and an afterthought to get you through the various levels and locations. Gameplay-wise, Ghost Rider appears to be a mashup of various aspects of Devil May Cry and God of War. 
From Devil May Cry it takes the style system and grading system, and from God of War it takes... Well, basically everything else, particularly the controls, as in they're literally identical, and it also takes most of the combos. Okay, well most might be an exaggeration, but the first time I did this one attack, I practically did the Leonardo DiCaprio point. Like, yeah, I know that attack. So it's definitely a game that wears its influences on its sleeve. Despite the similarities to Devil May Cry, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is very reminiscent of God of War. Matter of fact, the style system seems rather superfluous because the combat engine doesn't have enough versatility to make the most out of the style system. It's a bit too methodical and not quite smooth enough to blend combos together in most instances. As you probably well know, Devil May Cry is about the flamboyance of smoothly blending various different attacks together. Whereas here, blending is, well, not really possible. It's just you doing individual combos independently of each other. Which isn't a problem in itself, but like I said, makes the style system a little bit superfluous. The only time I really needed to pay attention to the specific style rank was when certain enemies showed up with shields that couldn't be broken unless you made it to that specific rank. Which can be a bit frustrating, but it encourages you to use a wider range of attacks, which thankfully the game provides. At first you don't have too many, but you'll quickly earn enough experience to unlock new attacks. And that's when this game really starts to shine. At first I wasn't digging Ghost Rider because of that limited combo pool, but once you have a decent amount of attacks unlocked and work them into your playstyle, there's a lot of fun to be had. I was going combo mad with a smile on my face, and I do mean that 100% genuinely. Once things got going, I was having a great time, merrily hack and slashing my way through hordes of demons. I realize now that as a God of War veteran, I do appreciate games that copy it right down to the controls because if it's good, then it's like slipping into an old comfortable pair of slippers. That's one of the reasons I like Dante's Inferno so much. It's a bit weird to me that the strong attacks are the short range attacks and the light attacks use the chain. It's a little bit backwards, but never mind. Either way, you got your selection of various light attacks and heavy attacks, as well as things like a Rage of the God style mode, a shotgun, a super clearing attack, and so on. The animations are a bit janky, but the combat has a real solid amount of catharsis behind it thanks to the sound design and all the visual flair, with enemies that react accordingly. The combos are nicely varied and fun to use. I particularly liked this flame tornado attack and found myself inadvertently hip thrusting whenever I used this ground pound attack. It's pretty well balanced as far as damage distribution as well. I never found there were any combos I never used. Their usefulness is well balanced with the ease of which you can pull them off, and I do appreciate that some of them are particularly useful with specific situations or playstyles, like the double pounce attack that can only be done while blocking, which makes it perfect for a defensive playstyle and surprise attacks. I do wish you'd go back to blocking afterwards if you're still holding the button down, but that's besides the point. The point being that the melee combat is well balanced, though otherwise the projectiles are a bit slow, but that's about it. Plus, the speed at which you can unlock everything means the combat is ever-evolving, and the game definitely keeps up a fast pace. I managed to beat it in just over 4 hours, and it has 30 levels between its two gameplay styles, so you're never in the same level for more than a few minutes, meaning there's never a dull moment. The structure of every section of the game is pretty much identical. You go to a new location, and you have to make your way to a mini-boss in order to get a new power. Then you backtrack to use your new power to pass through a barrier, you fight a boss, then right off to the next location. You only have a small handful of new enemies per every set of level, but you're never stuck in one location for so long that the repetition becomes noticeable. You go through Hell, an abandoned old western style town, a Metal Gear Solid style underground facility, you go to a wrecked city at one point, there's also a carnival in there for some reason. Yes, I know it's the place where Johnny's dad died, I'm being snide. The gameplay though is definitely not perfect. Despite the circle button allegedly being grab, to my knowledge there's not a single enemy that you can actually grab. The only time it comes up is when an enemy is at critical health and you can grab them to finish them off. But outside of that hyper-contextual instance, there's no use for that button. I would have liked a proper grapple attack, but I guess that would have required some more animations, and I'm assuming they were probably running short on time. It's sad, because the contextual final blow stops really being a thing from like the second half onwards, because the option to do the contextual final blow only appears once the enemies are below a certain amount of health but your more powerful attacks do so much damage, they generally skip over having critical health to just being dead. Also, every set of enemies has a ranged variant, and I absolutely despise ranged enemies. They are the hardest enemies in the game to deal with. Many times, they'll be in some corner off screen somewhere throwing pot shots at you while you're mid-combo on one of the melee guys, and they'll always run away from you when you try to fight them. 
and they throw just enough ranged enemies in there that they get fiddly to fight as they hit you out of your combo animations and reset your style meter. It's worth it in every single combat scenario to deal with them first, even before the massive dudes. Thankfully, they stop being an issue a short ways through the game once you figure out how to optimally get through the average combat scenario. Which ties into one of my biggest issues with the main gameplay, which is, on medium at least, it's far too easy. You gain Demon Souls, aka experience, really quickly, and the upgrades aren't that expensive. You can level up your health and spirit to maximum by the end of the first couple levels, after which no enemy encounter is tough enough to threaten you. Your Rage of the Gods mode lasts so long and recharges so quickly, you can pretty much use it in every other encounter, and sure, your Rage of the Gods style attack shares a bar with your shotgun, which theoretically makes it a moment-to-moment -moment choice between the two, but the shotgun isn't so useful that it will be the difference maker in most situations. And besides, you unlock different projectile attacks later on. And even once that runs out, you have the demon charge attack, which might as well be renamed to F*** you, I win. It will kill or greatly damage every enemy around you, most of which will drop more demon charge, meaning that if you use this attack during a large enemy encounter, using this attack will almost certainly fill your meter back up almost all the way. Plus, if you're stuck in a situation where you need to get your style meter up, using this attack will almost always bump your style meter by multiple bars. So you get pretty overpowered pretty quickly. The only time I died was because the game decided to switch the design of the healing pools halfway through the game to these flaming barrels. I genuinely thought these were just part of the set dressing, not knowing that caused me to die to a really long level, but once that was all said and done, it was all fairly smooth sailing. Honestly, medium is so easy that I was constantly A ranking or S ranking every level on my first and only playthrough. For the record, the rankings are D, C, B, A, S, and V. So if you play through this game, be sure to start out on hard. Though the gameplay is overall stimulating enough that I didn't mind. Though I think the worst flaw of the main gameplay is... Well, pickups are just too slow. You can't pick them up manually, but they'll auto-track to you, but only a few at a time. And after big battles, there's a lot of pickups. So this can take quite a while. So if you're hoping to get every bit of XP, you might be waiting a while. Now. People who have played this game, I know exactly what you're about to say, and that's if you hold the block button, the pickups will auto-track to you quicker. I only realized this after going through my footage, where it was mentioned in a single line of the tutorial, which was easy enough to miss that I missed it. So yes, this issue had a solution, but it shouldn't have been an issue to begin with. Why deliberately make pickups auto-track to you this slowly by default? What was the thought pattern in that? But I specify worst flaw in the main gameplay because this game also has another gameplay mode. Whenever they need you to switch locations, they have you do a motorcycle level, and fuck me raw. These are terrible. There's like a full second delay on the turning, making specific movements difficult. It doesn't hinder you at first, but later in the game where you're required to make hairpin turns before jumps, and worst of all, do precision platforming, it's like pulling teeth. It may look like I just suck in instances like this, but trust me, it's only because the delay makes it hard to gauge timing. Plus, the game had a habit of having jumps with a roof low enough that you'll hit it if you actually jump. Meaning that you had to hit this sweet spot where you jump early on the ramp, but not too early. Sometimes you'll also not make a jump you'll clearly made, and there's no way to reverse or backtrack, leading to a situation like this where I was caught in the scenery because there was no way for me to backtrack, but I also couldn't crash to reset my positioning. This mode is a nightmare. But once again, the health is so generous in this game, you'll almost never need to restart unless you want to get a better rank. And they must be doing something right, because my lone overall vengeance rank in the game was in one of these levels. It's a shame they couldn't take some of the difficulty, earned or unearned, from these levels and put it into the final boss, which is an absolute chump. He takes hits like a glass shield. Definitely the easiest boss in the game. I know I've spent the majority of this chunk of the video ragging on Ghost Rider, but all these issues I've brought up are ultimately nits around a solid core. I think Ghost Rider is actually a fairly solid God of War style hack and slash, and definitely worth checking out if you're into the genre. It surprises me to see this game got such negative reviews back in the day. Although, compared to other 2007 games, it's nothing special. 2007 had some real stiff competition. But as far as games that take inspiration from God of War, Ghost Rider is definitely a worthwhile game in my books.
Okay, so I have a confession to make. When I first envisioned a video where I cover five separate superhero tie-in games that took inspiration from God of War, I thought I could find a fifth game that unambiguously took inspiration. Turns out there was no one good choice. There was Conan, but then this wouldn't be a superhero collection, it would be a comic book hero collection, and that doesn't scan as well. So my options basically came down to three separate Spider-Man games. First you had Web of Shadows, but that's one I've already decided doesn't fit the bill because it's open world, and I would hate to go back on my word out of desperation. The second is Shattered Dimensions, but on the spectrum of spectacle fighters, say that five times drunk, that one is more on the Devil May Cry end, so that left me with one option. Spider-Man Friend or Foe. Not the worst choice in the world, but even if it does kind of look like it takes inspiration from God of War, it definitely feels more like a generic brawler. Plus, it's not necessarily a movie tie-in game, although it might as well be. You see, the developers, Next Level Games, said that Friend or Foe was a new take on the movies, meaning it borrows the aesthetic and many of the characters from the Sam Raimi trilogy, and this game also came out in 2007, coincidentally around the release of Spider-Man 3, so it was definitely trying to capitalize on those movies, hoping to trick a few ignorant kids and parents alike. Although they didn't go as far as to get the actors from the movies, so much to my dismay, Tobey Maguire doesn't play Spider-Man here, which is a shame because Tobey's voice acting in the Spider-Man movie games was deliciously awful. Instead, they got... James Arnold Taylor? The hell? All right, come on. We're headed to Egypt next. Well, anyway, the story is thus. Spider-Man's just chilling in New York as you do, and suddenly gets attacked by four separate villains. It's not going well, but he's saved by whatever Harry Osborn is going by these days. And it all comes to a standstill when suddenly everyone's attacked by the weird symbiote-like creatures, only for everyone to be mysteriously warped away one by one, and Spider-Man gets scooped up by the S.H.I.E.L.D. airship. As it turns out, a mysterious villain found a shard of the Venom symbiote and is using it to clone an army of symbiote-like creatures they call Phantoms, which is an acronym for Perpetual Holographic Avatar Nanotech Offensive Monsters. That was just word salad. So now we have to go all over the world retrieving the other symbiote shards before the mystery villain can find them, use them to strengthen the Phantoms, and take over the world. It's a decent framing device, but the fact that we have to go all over the world retrieving the same MacGuffins in varying locations means that Spider-Man Friend or Foe has the building blocks of a completely static plot, and a static plot it certainly has. Nothing really happens. You just go from place to place fighting various Spider-Man villains and getting symbiote shards rinse and repeat for an incredibly tedious six hours. There's a plot twist late into the game where Mysterio, who turns out to be the resident Mwahahar, steals all but one symbiote shard, forcing Spider-Man to use the last symbiote shard on himself as a power-up so he can stop Mysterio. But that one lone blip on the heart monitor is about it. They attempt to spice up this flat line of a plot by inserting what they think is humor, but the humor is just... awful. To the point that you'd be mistaken for thinking they're not even trying to be funny. Had it not been for characters constantly quipping about how this is not the time for jokes and whatnot. Spider-Man, party of two, your bad guys are ready. This is no time for comedy, Spider-Man. The itsy bitsy spider's gonna web you in the face. I'll punch you and sing another bar. Those aren't even jokes. That's just matter-of-fact running commentary that they're treating as humor. Even their more overt attempts at humor fall flat for me, like Nick Fury's banter with his own computer. Rhino's strength is only matched by his lack of wits. Warning. <laughs> Smells like a rhinoceros. All right, that's enough. I want some computer techs in here right now. I want- Yeah, I wouldn't exactly go to the stand-up circuit with that material. I spent all of these scenes with a look on my face like this. The writing is so dry and witless, and the lack of plot progression makes most of this game fly by in a blurry haze of tedium. Even now, I struggle to remember any one specific moment, and that's not exactly helped by the boring gameplay. Full disclosure, I did actually play this game as a kid, and I also quite liked it back then, especially playing it two-player with my brother. But it's one of those games that does not hold up to a modern viewpoint. I understand that this was a game made for kids, but there are plenty of games that I played as a kid that I still enjoy to this day. So I don't consider that a valid excuse for video games. If something can only be enjoyed by kids, even with the benefit of nostalgia, they deserve better. This game is kind of God of war -y in that you have normal attacks, heavy attacks, grapples, things that function like magic attacks, a fixed camera, etc, etc, etc. But notably no quick time events unless you count contextual takedown moves for large enemies when they get to low health, more's the pity. But the game, much like the story, is just obnoxiously tedious. Part of that has to do with the lack of enemy variety. You have small, medium, large, and extra large enemies. That's literally it. Every enemy in this game follows the exact same template of one of these four types. 
Every time you reach a new set of levels, you get a different variety of these same templates, but they're still functionally the same enemies, just with a different color scheme, more health, and slight differences in the fine details. The only enemies that change worth a damn are the extra large ones, because they'll have different attacks and behaviors and whatnot, however, you only see a handful of those in each set of levels. Otherwise, you're just fighting superficial variations of the same enemies. And even if each set of levels had a wildly different variety of these punching bags, you'd still be spending more than an hour fighting the same four guys. Then you combine that with the fact that you're not actually getting any functional gameplay change. So it's just a tedium on tedium sandwich with a little bit of tedium sprinkled on top because enemy encounters are ceaseless. It feels like you're locked into a new enemy encounter every 10 steps, and some of these sections have so many enemy respawns that I genuinely thought my game was glitched. These two issues combined makes it feel like you're wading through mud trying to make progress. Which is just as well, because this game has absolutely nothing to offer beyond the combat. There is collectible side content, but there's very little exploration involved, because it's usually barely out of the way or in plain sight. And since this game offers nothing but combat, that might have been alright if the combat wasn't so tedious in its own right. As Spider-Man, you have more combos than any other character, but that's still only a small handful. The most variety you get is from the web shooters, which you unlock a new mode for at the beginning of the second and third set of levels, which adds a spark to the heart monitor in that you get some new toys to play with, and each mode has multiple upgrades, but after that the game has nothing to mix things up. Plus, the novelty only lasts a few minutes, but if you're like me, once the novelty wears off, you'll just gravitate towards what's easiest, and for me, that's the web throw, because you can just yeet people off the stage. As far as hand-to-hand -hand combat, it doesn't feel good. It just feels very weak overall. There's no bite to the combat, no weight. And the fact that there's very little penalty for death eliminates any sort of stakes and makes this game incredibly mindless. At least Spider-Man has a few combos, unlike his support characters who have all of one. Each. This game's lone unique selling point is that you can play as either Spider-Man or something like 12 of his friends and foes, hence the name. It's a case of, you can, but why would you want to? Spider-Man is the character they put all the effort into, so he has the most upgrades, the most abilities, the most moves, and is generally the easier character to use. The problem with having 12 extra playable characters is that you can't put any amount of focus on any of them, so a lot of them just end up playing the same or similar, and they're never going to have the same versatility as the main character. They follow a few basic character templates, and will have two unique strong attacks, one of which you need to buy, also, on a side note, can I just say, considering there was an entire set of levels set in Transylvania, not including Morbius was a real missed opportunity. Many of these friends and foes are only good for a one-time novelty to test them out, but otherwise you'll probably just gravitate towards the most broken characters. Black Cat, for example, is one of the few characters who plays similarly to Spider-Man and can infinitely juggle medium-sized enemies. And by the end of the game, I found myself utilizing Venom more than any other character because Venom has the same web grab that Spider-Man does, but is also the large character template, which means he can pick up and throw large enemies. Which is good, because it's a nice quick way to deal with them if there's a convenient ledge nearby, because large enemies are the most damage spongy of all the damage spongy enemies. Other than the extra large enemies, but they are less enemies and more brick walls. And quite frankly, from about halfway through, I was so ungodly bored that I graduated to just throwing enemies off the nearest ledge, if I could. At first I was tokenly trying to play the game as intended, but I was so bored I just wanted to finish the game, and despite being only like five and a half hours long, it feels like it goes on forever. I remember looking at the recording timer at one point, and it only said 55 minutes, and I remember thinking to myself, that is the longest 55 minutes of my life. It was genuinely paralyzing, not helped by boring visuals. I was showing this game to some friends while I was recording it, and when I got to the Cairo section, they made the point that the environments dominated by a single color made it look like a test stage. But the entire game just looks kind of dreary and repetitive, and the overall texturing and modeling looks low quality even for the time. But the animations are kind of funny at times, like how your character's upper body doesn't move while they're carrying something, and there's something so absurd about seeing Doc Gawk running around on two feet. You'd think the idea of having special mechanical arms means he doesn't need to do that, but that might require some extra animation work. But something about his run cycle screams out of shape man running for the bus. And I couldn't unsee that. And speaking of animations, why do characters fly around in the in-between frames of cutscenes? Look at that. I don't know. Nothing could salvage this game for me. It's so boring and repetitive and just screams cynical cash grab. I know this game has its fans and its defenders, but before you jump to this game's defense, just try to play it again. Plug in your old console and give it a whirl, and then consider to yourself if it's really a game worth defending. To me, I played it as a kid, but after this, I don't think I'm ever going to want to play it again. That is, unless I need a quick cure for insomnia.
Thor, God of Thunder. Holy crap on a cracker, this game is not good. So, a bit of context. I actually bought this game a while back because back when this channel started, I was flying by the seat of my pants trying to find a direction that worked, and there was a time when I intended to take this channel in a completely different direction, and I was going to do an MCU tie-in game retrospective, but then completely lost interest in the project about three levels into the Iron Man PS3 game. I'd already bought half the games I was going to cover by the time I lost interest, so now I'm just stuck with things like Thor God of Thunder. A tie-in game for the movie Thor. A movie I saw like 10 times as a teenager, but in hindsight remember next to nothing about because this was back when MCU Thor had the personality of a sponge cake. Although I do remember the atomic bitch slap. As for the game, it's a somewhat loose adaptation of the movie's plot. It's specifically adapted to eliminate any part of the plot that wouldn't involve gameplay, meaning Thor is never sent to Earth without Mjolnir. So what does that mean for the plot? Well, essentially the Ice Giants invade Asgard, so Thor goes in alone to fight them in their home world, royally screws the pooch, and has to fix his own mess. Every single move he makes, every mistake, is directly influenced by Loki because Loki is trying to use Thor's hubris against him, to make Thor look like a completely unfit ruler so that Odin would see Loki as the true heir to Asgard. Plot-wise, it's about as good of an adaptation as you could hope for given what they're working with, but it's really let down by the vocal performances. What is the state of Asgard? The situation is grim. You see, Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, and Jamie Alexander reprised their roles from the movie. This being back when they were small enough actors that a publisher like Sega could afford to bring them in for voice work. See also Robert Downey Jr. in the 2008 Iron Man video game. Everything I've built, countless lives, ruined by my inventions, I have to destroy them. But just like any time you get a celebrity to do a voiceover adaptation of their own character, the performance is weak at best. Finish man, Gorg, and all is done. Destroy what you have unleashed on Asgard. In my rush to vengeance, I let the creature loose. That is true. But I was not unadvised. And what two have wrought, two can put to right. Two? I'd imagine this is a common issue, because on one hand, you don't need to bring your A-game to a video game voiceover because nobody's expecting you to, so it won't hurt your career if you half-ass it. And also, they aren't trained voice actors, it's an entirely different skill set, so if you expect a live-action voice actor to pull the same performance as somebody who actually knows what they're doing, well, you're going to get a pretty sad wake-up call, and stuff like this is an example. Still, the gameplay is at least... Actually, it's pretty whack. I'll give Thor God of Thunder this. It's better than I expected. Take that for what you will. To give it some level of faint praise, I was enjoying myself in parts, but it's absolutely not well designed or even really a finished game. It's really the bare bones example of a game in this genre, making the overall package severely lacking in pretty much every way. The very first thing I noticed is that the button mapping is questionable. The main combos you can do are done by hitting the square button a set amount of times, followed by the triangle button. But the triangle button is your Odin Force attack, which I'm just going to be referring to as magic attack for simplicity. So half the time I used my magic, it was unintentional because I was trying to finish off a combo I was doing. But the timing was slightly off, leading to accidental magic usage, and wasting precious magic power is a pain in the ass, considering it's not easily replenished, is used up really quickly, and most of your attacks worth a damn require magic. Your standard magic attacks are all fairly piss weak, so you need to be saving it for the big clearing attacks that can devastate an entire room. The hammer combos are pretty decent. There aren't a hell of a lot of them, but there are enough to work with, and to give this game credit, later on you get the ability to buff your combos by holding down the triangle button on the final hit. The combos are decently responsive, the combat just doesn't feel very good because the enemies don't feel very reactive, and I feel that's down to subpar sound design and animations. Admittedly, the raw act of gameplay is stimulating to me because I just like the genre, and it's certainly functional, but there's nothing about the combat in Thor God of Thunder that really elevates it beyond the minimum appeal that this genre provides. The grapple attacks are at least distinctive compared to other games in the genre. Depending on which grab you do, you either get experience, health, or Odin Force, which means you're always able to replenish whatever it is you need. Plus, you have no less than five separate upgrades for all your different skills, so you can specialize slightly. I went straight for health and melee, so I might not have been playing optimally. I feel like I'm reaching for nice things to say because this game is in short supply of them. 
What I discovered about the combat after a short amount of time is that it's extremely easy to cheese. There are basically only a small handful of enemy types regardless of which chapter you're in, and each enemy archetype is fought in basically the same way. The small enemies you can fight in the regular way, and they'll die in only a handful of hits, but you can also grapple them and kill them in one hit. As a matter of fact, there's literally no reason not to do this because it's significantly more expedient than fighting them in the normal way. As for the medium guys, they can be a bit of trouble, but as long as you dodge out of the way of their attacks and use whatever combo you feel like while they're distracted, you'll do just fine. However, even then, I remember the universal rule of badly designed God of War knockoffs, when in doubt, take to the skies. And lo, was that true here. You see, most God of War style games don't account for what happens if you attack from the air. Most games don't bother to program anti-air attacks, so once you're attacking them from one pixel above the range of their ground attacks, they're pretty much helpless. The only enemies that gave me trouble were these giant goliath dudes where you have to break their armor piece by piece, because they have the endurance of a fat guy at a buffet, so it's not so much fighting a boss as much as it is breaking down a wall with an ice pick. And this is what gives Thor God of Thunder its difficulty curve. That is to say, the difficulty is all over the place. A lot of the time, it's insultingly easy. Then you have random intervals where the game becomes suddenly and unreasonably hard. And that's usually in conjunction with a large enemy or a boss. I don't even find these bosses to be a fun challenge. They're just damage sponges that take way too long to beat. There's usually no way to gauge which attack they're going to do, and even if there is, they attack so quickly that it's hard to find the correct reaction time. Plus, they can also break through your guard. You basically have to go in, do a short combo, and back off, which takes forever. As for the boss bosses, they're even more damage spongy, and I genuinely don't know how I'm supposed to avoid some of these attacks, but I later discovered that the functional weakness of basically every enemy in the game is the lock-on hammer throw. It does way more damage than the regular hammer throw. It uses a bit of Odin force, but if you're only fighting one enemy, there's a lot more bang for your buck here, as it's specifically designed for attacking one enemy. I would have said these are good enemies to hoard your Rage of the Gods mode for, but surprisingly, despite starring a god, there actually is no Rage of the Gods style mode in this game. I thought there was, because in some instances, you need to build up your power before unleashing a giant attack, but these are all hyper-contextual, both when they happen and the final attack that it unleashes. I was really trying to enjoy this game, but every time I felt myself getting into it, something quickly pulled me out of it. There's a lot of parts to Thor God of Thunder that, with a little bit of extra time to test and polish, could have been better, because there are so many obvious things to fix. First and foremost being the camera, which is way too sensitive. The stick acceleration is ridiculous. You move the stick like one-tenth of a millimeter and it goes like 20% faster. And pushing the stick all the way makes the camera move ungodly fast. It's so hard to control. And there's no way to adjust the camera sensitivity, so it's just something you have to live with. It's not so bad during the main game. Well, it's livable, because as obnoxious as it is, the specific positioning of where the camera is looking isn't quite as important as the other aspects of gameplay. But sometimes you'll be locked into an on-rail shooter section, and I don't think calling these a chore adequately describes how terribly they play. I'd honestly rather do the dishes than play another one of these rail shooter sections or otherwise any section of the game that requires precision throwing. And the animation is janky as hell, which doesn't seem like that big of an issue, but most characters will bounce between animation states with nary a transition, so it makes enemy attacks hard to telegraph at times. Also, navigation can be a bit of a pain in the ass. A lot of the time you jump between locations using your hammer throw, but the indicator to do so doesn't always stand out amongst the busy scenery. The sad thing is, through all of this, I powered through the good and the bad, but for me, the part that was the absolute breaking point was the final level in Asgard, which is the worst part of the game to be the breaking point if you ask me. My enjoyment of the game up to that point was a f***ing sine wave, but this is where the sine wave broke and everything went unforgivably downhill. They all but tell you that you should save scum in this part, and that's because Asgard has a health bar that refills when you succeed in certain objectives and will drain at pretty much every other interval. But the health carries over from sequence to sequence, and you need all the health you can get in some of these sequences. So it's entirely possible to screw yourself over. If you lose a little bit too much health in one sequence, you won't have enough to get through the next. That literally happened to me, and I had to give up 30 minutes of progress because I couldn't finish this fight with this ice giant before Asgard crumbled. Because these things already take ages to beat, so adding an obnoxious ticking clock element makes this controller throwingly frustrating. And yeah, that's right, this is a 30 plus minute level that you can just balls up in and lose all progress. 
and there are some instances that I have no idea how you're supposed to get through without Asgard taking significant damage. The first part of this had to do with manually destroying these bombs before they reach Asgard. But you're being bombarded with enemies, the bombs are just out of the way enough that they're obnoxious to hit, and you're already dealing with the hypersensitive camera. Did anybody test this? Did anybody stop and think that this entire level is a bad idea on a fundamental design level? It was a level that killed what little goodwill I had left over for the game, so that by the time I got to the final boss, I was just so done. The final boss was the most damage spongy of all the damage spongy enemies in the game, and I fought him a few times and decided I was just done with the game and quit. I could have beat him given a few more tries, but I just had absolutely no desire to play this game anymore. They blew their load and I checked out. The fact that I found myself having fun at times tells me that there is a good game in here somewhere that could have been brought out had they had more time, but of course the universal problem with movie tie-in games is that the game needs to be roughly out by the time the movie is out. It has a few neat ideas, the way it adapts the Thor movie is well done, and there is enough here that it is a somewhat interesting game mechanically, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired, and I don't see myself ever coming back to this particular game, no matter how big of a fan I am of this style of game. And what's funny is, I wanted to let my opinion of this game simmer for a while to see how I really felt, but the only thing that happened is I forgot most of the game and had to watch back my footage to even remember large chunks of it. I only really remembered the frustrating parts, which tells me that this game is mostly forgettable at best, which I don't think should be a controversial statement, but I've been wrong before. In brightest day, in darkest night, feel the weariness and blight. No flaw shall escape my sight, cause holy crap this game is shite. Okay, that's an exaggeration, I just wanted to say that. And now for Green Lantern Rise of the Manhunters, a tie-in game for the 2011 Green Lantern movie, which was part of DC's first ill-fated attempt to launch a DC cinematic universe. They eventually got there with Man of Steel, but Green Lantern was a complete non-starter because it was generally considered one of the lesser superhero movies ever made, to the point that it's become a running joke with Ryan Reynolds' other work. I never saw the movie because I couldn't be asked, but I know I'm not missing much, so Rise of the Manhunters could be a completely different plot to the movie and I wouldn't know. The plot as it is, however, is very simple. The Manhunters, apparently some sort of robotic galactic police force that became corrupt and were subsequently phased out, have now invaded the planet Oa with the intention of wiping out the Green Lantern Corp. Then after repelling the invasion, Hal Jordan, our resident Green Lantern of the day, answers a distress call from the planet Xamaron, which is presently under attack by what's called the Will Hunters, a Manhunter-made machine specifically designed for mind control. And after saving Xamaron, you move to the Manhunter homeworld and find this whole ordeal has been engineered by Amon Sur, the son of Avon Sur, the greatest Green Lantern to ever exist and original possessor of Hal Jordan's ring. You then go back to Oa and defeat Amon, and that's literally it. I give this game credit for not drawing the plot out for several hours, but there is just so little plot here it's almost see-through. As a matter of fact, I have a feeling that the entire sequence on Xamaron was put in because they realized they needed something to pad this game out to at least a relatively acceptable length. Especially because the whole sequence on Xamaron feels so disconnected and pointless because it doesn't really play into the larger plot of the game, other than separating Hal from his buddy Kilowog so that the latter can be captured. I don't know, there's just so much desperation here, and it feels like the game is just twiddling its thumbs until it can say, alright, four hours, that's an acceptable length. I mean, it's so paper thin, I got nothing to complain about other than how paper thin it is. So, well played Double Helix Games. So, how about that gameplay then? Well, it's actually surprisingly a lot more competent than I thought it was going to be. Talk about faint praise. And it's for sure miles better than Thor. Once again, faint praise. The animation is good, the game looks and sounds alright, the combat feels pretty decent. The first thing I noticed is that this game controls literally identically to God of War, right down to dodge being mapped to the right analog stick. It also has a lot of the same combos. You know how God of War has that iconic ground slam combo which is done by ending a series of light attacks with a single heavy attack? Well, Green Lantern certainly has that. So they couldn't be wearing their influence on their sleeve anymore if they tried. But like I said, this isn't a bad thing because it's already a familiar setup. Which means to anybody familiar with similar games, there's no adjustment period. You can start the game up and immediately know exactly what you're doing. Plus, it's also two player. You know, if you can rope another person desperately bored enough to play this with you. And boy does the game not let you forget that it's two-player. 
On the surface, Rise of the Manhunters isn't a mind-blowing game, but it definitely has a level of competency about it that you don't always see with tie-in games. But once you start digging, it really lets itself down. The first major difference is, you eventually unlocked different attacks in God of War, whereas in Rise of the Manhunters, you pretty much have all your combos from the very start. There are other additions to the combat, and we'll get into that, but the moment-to-moment -moment melee combat is the same at the beginning as it is at the end. They also make a really big mistake by giving you a long-ranged grab and allowing you to grab the majority of the enemies in the game. Because if there's a ledge around, I have literally no reason not to yeet everything in my immediate vicinity off the nearest ledge. It's especially funny because if there are enough enemies around you, you can actually put yourself into a near-infinite loop of throwing people without needing to touch the ground. So there's not a hell of a lot that can stop you at that point. The major unique gameplay element is that they used the Green Lantern Ring to introduce a bunch of unique attacks that you can slot in and out called Constructs, and they each use a set amount of your ring's power. I will admit, I didn't focus my upgrade points into these so much, I mostly focused on the ring surge power-ups and melee power-ups. I found a few attacks that I generally liked and stuck to them, and I realize in hindsight that I might have made a mistake, because close to the end of the game I got the mech armor construct and it was easily the most effective attack I got, despite having fully upgraded melee attacks. Internally, I was just focusing on attacks I already had and knew how to use, rather than taking a risk on something new. But it's clear to me now that the something new might have been the intended way to play the game, so that's my fault. Now, I mentioned the Ring Surge a moment ago, and aside from sounding like some sort of euphemism for a quivering butthole, it's essentially your Rage of the Gods mode. On the surface, all it does is give you unlimited power for your Ring Constructs, but it can be upgraded to be much more useful, and much like other aspects of the gameplay, you'll be able to purchase new upgrades for Ring Surge as you level up, but you can only level up to level 10, so it's not a big deal. You'll unlock all the different upgrades for all the different aspects of gameplay by the time you beat the game. I feel like this game is mechanically sound, but about an hour in, once the initial flare of the game wore off, I realized that I was bored as hell, and I couldn't quite put my finger on why until a while later. I realized it's because this game's pacing is awful. First of all, I wouldn't describe most enemies as damage sponges, but they definitely have about 50% more health than I feel they should. Enough that they're tedious to fight, but not so much that it becomes immediately apparent. Even the obligatory quick-time event sequences for killing larger enemies have these long, drawn-out animations with multiple button prompts. I usually didn't even bother because it was quicker just to beat them into submission. If you're going to do a quick-time event kill sequence, at least make it quick. Then there are a lot of enemies in every encounter, and when you're getting swarmed, you don't have any good crowd-clearing attacks until a ways through the game. Most attacks I found either did mild damage to multiple enemies or significant damage to one or two enemies. And in a lot of cases, there will be contextual conditions on the fight that make it harder for you to damage enemies, such as needing to destroy a couple of crystals that give all nearby enemies an impenetrable shield. And even on an individual level, some of these enemies have contextual aspects that make them hard to fight like these hovercraft dudes or the guys with shields. You don't really fight them in any unique way, you just have to hit them enough times until their hovercraft or shield or whatever is destroyed. It's just that they take more damage or they're harder to hit. Then you can just fight them in the regular way, i.e. yeeting them off the nearest ledge. It's just adding extra tedious steps between you and victory without actually expanding on the scope of the combat or introducing unique gameplay elements. The only thing that these contextual aspects do is make them harder to hit, but you still do the same attacks on them. It's just so static, and it feels like with every new encounter, they're just adding new ways to draw out the fight. And a lot of the puzzle design in this game is definitely needlessly padded. The entire philosophy of the puzzle design in this game is, why do something once when you can do it three times? Like, I've demonstrated my ability to use the Green Lantern baseball bat to knock back projectiles. Why must I do it three times for every node and twice for every hovercraft? Why place one orb when you can place two? Why place one mine down a shaft when you can place, like, five? That's a puzzle that was so good, they thought to bring it back multiple times. To be fair, there is, like, a single good puzzle in the entire game. You have to grab these different orbs and put them into combinations of pedestals with different symbols on them to unlock doors. That actually requires a bit of observation, although the orbs had a habit of going walkabouts. At one point, I lost this orb in the corner of the room for like five minutes, but that's about it. And then because there's only three actual levels in the entire game, they have to pad these levels out into an hour plus, despite the fact that you're doing functionally the same thing the entire time. There's no real progression, and you could easily cut these levels down and not miss a thing. This one moment is a prime example of how tedious this game can get just for the sake of padding its length. 
I was going through one of these space harrier sections, which are fine, I suppose, but I had to fight this mini boss halfway through. His attacks are piss easy to avoid, so it's just a matter of whittling his health down with little opposition. And it took forever for no good reason. Even using Ring Surge, I was only whittling his health down a couple of percent at a time. And there's only a small handful of different enemy types in the entire game. So few, in fact, the handful of mini bosses that they have end up being wheeled out as regular enemies later on. And they still take just as long to fight. It sure as hell isn't a safe space on the disc here, because we're on Blu-ray. And these yellow variations of the giant manhunter are the worst enemy in the game, because they can just grab you straight out of your attack animation and start draining your ring power. Which once again just adds another sprinkling of tedium on this tedium sandwich. It just got to the point where I was bored out of my mind after about an hour, and by hour 4 I was just begging for this game to end as I made my way through samey environments fighting the same enemies and solving the same puzzles. I was so done. It wasn't the longest 4 hours of my life, but it definitely overstays its welcome despite being far too short. The lack of length and mechanical depth makes this game feel so vapid. I don't hate Green Lantern Rise of the Manhunters, it's certainly not the worst game I've played today, but it's definitely not something I'll be rushing in for a second playthrough of. But just based off the mechanics which are solid in a vacuum, I could very well see a good game in here somewhere if they had more time to flesh it out and create meaningful progression, but unfortunately that ain't the world we're living in. Oh man, this is the big one. X-Men Origins Wolverine, popularly considered one of the best movie tie-in games ever. Not a surprise considering it's not made by some nobody developer, but one with a genuine pedigree behind it, that being Raven Software, famous for such things as the Hexen slash Heretic series, Singularity, and Marvel's Ultimate Alliance. And for as good as this game is considered, it's ironically a tie-in for one of the worst superhero movies of all time. But I'm gonna surprise you guys when I say this, I have a soft spot for this movie. I know, right? Let me get something straight. It's not a good movie by any stretch of the imagination, but I can't in good conscience hate it, and it comes down to one very personal reason. My cat Gambit got his name because of this movie, because he, the cat, had a diamond on his nose, and we drew the connection with playing cards, and my mother was a fan of Gambit from this movie. Sadly, Gambit is no longer with us as he had to be put down due to an incredibly aggressive and untreatable cancerous tumor. That cat will always hold a special place in my heart, and as a result, so will the movie, in spite of everything. As for the game, though, well, it's one of those 7th gen games that have shot up in price quite a bit in recent years, and I don't feel like paying extortionate amounts of money for a game from 2008, so this is actually a game that made me want to try my hand at PS3 emulation. Thankfully though, X-Men Origins Wolverine generally went off without a hitch. As far as adapting the movie, it's about as accurate an adaptation of the movie as you can get while also contriving a bunch of extra fight scenes into the story for gameplay's sake. I will say first of all, I heard this game described as psychotically gory several years back, and man did it turn out to be true. It's to the point that I feel like I might have to censor some of these scenes. The PS3 and Xbox 360 versions of this game are called the Uncaged Edition, where the Wii and PS2 version are both the regular edition. I think this had to do with console demographics. The average Wii and PS2 owner was probably much younger than your average PS3 and Xbox 360 owner around 2008. So they probably felt compelled to make the HD version excessively gory. The necessity of excessive gore, say that five times drunk, is something that's kind of taken on a case-by-case -case basis for me. You can have it all you want, but for me it's a question of whether or not the individual media really needs to be hyper-violent. This is a case where I think the gore actually enhances the game, because Wolverine is an inherently violent character considering his main weapons are knives that come out of his hands, but you don't really get to see him go all out that often because he's usually shackled to media aimed at a younger audience, so even if he does stab someone, it's almost universally bloodless. So if nothing else, it's kinda nice to see Wolverine go peanut butter banana sandwich on these fools. It's also nice to see his regeneration play into things, because to showcase regeneration, you first need to showcase him being wounded, and that doesn't tend to happen to a large degree for the same reason. 
I also like how his regeneration plays into gameplay. According to my friend who's a walking comic book encyclopedia, the comics have established that as long as one cell of Wolverine's body remains, he can fully regenerate. But that wouldn't make for a very interesting game, so here they change it to where his body regenerates, but if you take too much damage, your vital organs are exposed, and if they take critical damage, you're done. It's a neat, albeit morbid twist that makes Wolverine work within the context of a video game. Plot-wise, this game takes some pretty heavy creative liberties from the movie's plot, to the point that I actually think it's a much more well-put-together rendition of the same story. For example, where the origin story of Wolverine becoming disenfranchised with Stryker's team only took up the first bit of the movie's story, here it's a relevant plot thread that's present throughout most of the game. Essentially, every now and again, you bounce back and forth between the present and this flashback whenever things in the present need to be established, and the flashbacks to Operation Firestorm are a lot more intricate than how it is in the movie, involving multiple stages and several characters that weren't included therein, like Mystique. It ends in the same way as the movie's prologue, with the team threatening to massacre an entire African village over info they didn't have, then Logan decides he's not having any of it. But given the fact that this flashback takes up half the game, and in the movie it takes up all of 10 minutes, the game's version feels very anticlimactic because the build-up needed a better payoff. Not just the same payoff as a comparatively inconsequential prologue. Maybe a boss fight, for example. The present plot also adds several different additional elements to try and stretch what is essentially a two-hour movie into a ten-hour game. And as a result, it does feel a bit disjointed, with a lot of characters just coming and going without a trace. Most notably John Wraith and Mystique, who both escape via Chopper off-screen and are never seen again. But it's still structurally a million times better than the movie's plot, especially because the length gives the side characters more to do. Like the aforementioned John Wraith, who we have to rescue, and it's established that he's banging Mystique. You be careful, Miss Darkholm. That's my son you're carrying in there. See you up top. What you think of the name, Kurt? Kurt is a terrible name. I'm not sure how accurate that is to the comics, but it gives John Wraith more to do than just show up and die. Although he's still played by Will I Am, who somehow does a worse performance as a voice actor than as an actor in the actual film. Didn't stay around long enough to find out. Creed was the only one on the team that didn't seem to mind. Hell, he enjoyed that it. That bastard. Yes, surprisingly Will I Am and a number of actors from the movies reprised their roles here, including Hugh Jackman, which surprises me because I thought he would cost too much money at this point in his career. The movie actors' performances aren't great though, you can kind of tell they're mailing in their performances, and I know Hugh Jackman can be a decent voice actor when he tries, Hence the movie flushed away, but this ain't great. Hey Dukes, wow, it's been a long time. About 10 or 12 uh, hundred pounds ago. Maybe it's time to give the pork rinds a rest. The pacing does feel a little bit off as well. The levels in the Weapon X facility slash Alkali Lake as well as the Cybernetics Lab feel like they go on for five hours apiece, but when we return back to the movie's plot, we find Blob who tells us where Gambit is, and that's a level that lasts five minutes, maybe? Then tracking down Gambit is an hour and a half level, followed by the final level on Three Mile Island, which takes all of 15 minutes. So what happened here? Could they just not think of anything to pad out the movie's plot? Or were they just running out of resources or time when they got to the ending chunk of the game? To me, it feels like they wanted to make their own game separate from the movie, and so put in as much effort into their original story as they could, but were still contractually obligated to adapt the movie. It does make the middle chunk of the game drag a bit, but they get away with this because narratively to me, the parts where they shake loose from the movie's plot are where the narrative shines. Most notably in the Sentinel subplot and the intro slash outro of the game. The intro just appears to be some random hyper-violent display for Wolverine that could be happening at any time. But in the epilogue to this game, you get a cutscene where the scientist expresses thanks to Wolverine for destroying the Sentinel earlier in the game. Because of that, the scientist realized the flaws in his design. You don't know what he's talking about until... That's right, Sentinel Apocalypse. And cleverly, the chapter with the Sentinel subplot is called Days of Future Beginnings. This really makes me wish Raven Software could have been able to make a standalone sequel to this game based on this ending, but unfortunately not. As for the gameplay itself, this is a true Blue God of War knockoff, almost to the same degree as Dante's Inferno. You got light attacks, heavy attacks, grapples, guards, and so on. It plays very similarly to God of War, with a few twists of its own. What might surprise you is the production value of this game. 
With tie-in games almost universally, production value is an issue, whether that be janky animations, a serious lack of variety, or just plainly bad graphics. But this game has none of that. There's a decent bit of variety, it's smooth as butter, and the graphics are fantastic for the time. Which kind of puts this game into a league of its own in many ways. Raven Software are no slouches, and I guess they were out to really prove that here. For example, one aspect that really showcases the production value is Wolverine's shirt. It's a separate object to his body, which means during gameplay, as his body takes damage and regenerates, his shirt will actually disintegrate in real time, which is such an inconsequential detail, but something that really showcases the attitude of the developers. They wanted this to be more than just a tie-in game, though thankfully it's just his shirt because I really don't feel like seeing Wolverine schlong. Combat-wise, you have an upgrade system that keeps things fresh throughout most of the game, but you have upgrades that are also expensive enough that you can't unlock them all in one go. Ghost Rider. And you also have a leveling system, which is how you get new combos, and as you move through levels, you'll find various pickups, usually dog tags that give you XP, but occasionally you'll find mutagens, which can be slotted in and out to buff Wolverine in various ways, which are fun to experiment with. So this game is always throwing new things at you. Although it still does drag in parts. Like I said, there are a couple levels that go on far too long, and I feel they stretch the content a little too thin, but generally it maintains a good pace. And I'd say the core moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is good enough on its own that it can carry X-Men Origins Wolverine through the dull bits. Because the combat is visceral as hell. You really feel the weight of your strikes as you're just ripping people to shreds. It's down to this game's fantastic sound design. Like, the way they present Wolverine's attacks just sounds so satisfying. Listen to this. Plus, there's a certain visual flair that adds a nice cherry on top of proceedings. And ripping them to shreds is the operative phrase there, because this game is violent as hell. With decapitations happening more regularly than a conservative MP thinks about dick, and enough blood being splattered to give a vampire diabetes. So X-Men Origins Wolverine is definitely a good stress-relieving game for when you just want to get some aggression out, and it's glorious. That's not even to mention the Berserk mode, which is this game's version of Rage of the Gods, where you become twice as vicious. You're faster, and you tear people up like paper. You do, of course, have other rage attacks, all of which are situationally useful. People say that the Claw Spin was the least useful, but I got plenty of use out of that, though the Claw Tornado is admittedly overpowered. Otherwise, the combat isn't quite as varied as other games in the genre. Most of the combos are just mashing the square button and then finishing them off with the triangle button. There are other combos, but those are the main ones. Relatedly, with regenerating health, it can be a bit on the easy side at times, making it a bit mindless, but I feel the pure catharsis tickles the id enough that it's excusable. It ain't the deepest game out there, but for what it has, it makes the combat work. Make no mistake though, there are a lot of enemies with plenty of varied attacks and unique means to deal with them. Many enemies later on require you to parry their attacks before they're vulnerable, some will teleport around, and then there are the spider bots which are the bane of my existence. There's no obvious way to damage them without getting damaged yourself, and they have long-ranged beam attacks that will drain your rage. Though to be fair, very few enemies are immune to gravity, so that's always a decent go-to. And if there are no edges around, chances are there's an environmental hazard around you that you can throw someone into, usually leading to someone getting impaled. Which is always nice, and it's neat that the environmental hazards can also affect you. Sometimes it feels like they have a magnet attached to them for how you auto-track to them, but otherwise how are they going to showcase this feature? It's funny, a lot of these enemies will be introduced with a lot of pomp and circumstance, and then you just rip them to shreds. Kind of making a big deal out of nothing. The combat is overall shorter range than a lot of God of War style hack and slash games because Wolverine is just using his claws, but they make up for that by not having a fixed camera, which was the major issue that Dawn of the Dragon had, so it works all the same. You'd think that having the combat system be mostly short ranged, that ranged enemies would become an issue, but unlike Ghost Rider, where ranged enemies are the bane of the entire game, this game has a few means to close the distance. You have two different types of dodges, but more importantly, with the press of two buttons you can lunge at people from a long distance. To weaker enemies, it's a one-hit kill, but it might also knock certain enemies down, allowing you to do a jumping stab attack with them on the ground, meaning that in some cases you can actually stun lock enemies. I'd argue that the lunge is one of the unique selling points of the game because it's so endemic within the gameplay as it's integrated into so many different aspects of the combat and traversal generally. 
You'll use it in every fight and use it to traverse large gaps. It's even integrated into a lot of the mini boss fights. Occasionally you'll come across these big guys who you can't damage right off the bat, so you need to wait for an opening. Whether it be after stunning them or their hands are occupied so they can't bat you away. These fights are a little bit frustrating because they are the most damage spongy of all the enemies, making each encounter about twice as long as they need to be, and especially with the robot dudes, the timing on deflecting those missiles can be a bit finicky. Literally, I'd say each of these particular enemy encounters are actually more difficult than the final boss, not quite Deadpool. This fight really showcases how overpowered the lunge can be, considering I actually stunlocked not quite Deadpool, and in the second phase I only died a couple times because falling off the ledge is an instant game over. It was almost a shamefully easy boss fight. I think the hardest part for me was the Sentinel boss fight at the end of the second act, because it's huge, its attacks are hard to avoid, and it tanks hits like Michael Phelps being handed the bong. It felt like the true climax of the game, especially if the epilogue is anything to go off of, where, as I implied earlier, the actual climax being so truncated feels like it was put in out of a sense of obligation due to being a tie-in game. Something that's easy to forget. I think the best compliment you can give a tie-in game is that it feels standalone, and that's certainly true for X-Men Origins Wolverine. It's not just good for the standards it's dealing with, it's an excellent game in its own right. I could spend a whole day going over every detail, the disjointed Space Harrier minigame, the challenge battles to unlock alternate costumes, the hilarious moment where Wolverine's girlfriend walks into the sea, but at the end of the day, I think Raven Software went above and beyond for something they could have easily half-assed, making what is truly one of the best God of War inspired games out there. Definitely worth a look if you're into these games. And that was the superhero tie-in edition of the God of War knockoffs collection. This is an interesting case because there's really no spread in quality. You either have things that are really good or not so good at all. I'd say Ghost Rider and Wolverine are the two standouts of this collection, but I definitely have to give the nod to Wolverine just for its production value and the fact that it's more consistently good than Ghost Rider. But that's not to discount Ghost Rider, because it's a swell time as well. As for the other three, well, they encapsulate everything negative about tie-in games. I guess Spider-Man Friend or Foe gets a free pass because it's not much like God of War despite being boring as hell. Green Lantern on the other hand is competently made but boring, and Thor God of Thunder is just generally poorly made. Avoid that one like the plague. Rest assured though, there are plenty more games from this era that took clear inspiration from God of War, many of which are also tying games to other franchises. A couple that spring to mind immediately would be Conan, Clash of the Titans, and Beowulf. And there's also plenty of other games that took inspiration from God of War around this time other than that. Marlowe Briggs and the Mask of Death, Two Human, X-Blades, Heavenly Sword, Garshasp, Knight's Contract. I could go on, but you get the gist. So until next time, my friends, if you like what I do and want to support the channel, please consider pledging to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards like these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to users Inutsu, GAW004, and FarmCat84. Sorry for calling you the wrong name before. And if you want to support my channel for free, you can like this video, leave a comment telling me what you think, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. Otherwise, I've been the King of Snark Style, and I will see you next time. Peace!